All right. Seems like we are live. Yes, I can see us live. And I want somebody to please confirm the audio. If you're watching the stream, please tell me if you can hear me. Ah, I think it's working. That's fine. We still have a minute, so I'm just going to let people join and then we will start in a minute. Hi, Michael. Yes, thank you. Michael says we can hear you. Lady A can hear us too. Thank you. All right, we're just giving a few more seconds for people to join. And I can see people are still joining the live stream. And as soon as the clock hits 10.30 here, I'm in Seattle and Johnny is in UK, London, maybe he'll let you know. And then uh, we will start. So it's his evening, my morning. All right, here we are. Yes, Kuntal. I'm uh, glad to see you, Kuntal. Yes, it's audible, cool. All right, so here we are. We're starting um, the session on uh, e-commerce performance framework. Uh, today, my guest is Johnny. He is an expert in e-commerce conversion rate optimization and has built teams for convers conversion rate optimization for several companies. So he will be sharing his uh experience and his uh, ideas and thoughts on how he builds e-commerce pr uh, performance framework. So it'll be an exciting session. But before we got, dive into the session, please make sure to uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the like button on this video. Once you hit like, you know, other people are gonna see as well is in their stream. So that helps everybody. And the way this session works, those who are new, uh, we it's an interactive session. So it's not like you're listening uh, to me or to Johnny, you will actually be able to participate and drive some of the conversation there. So feel free to point, uh, feel free to write your questions. I will read them to Johnny. Uh, there is a bit of lag between when I say something or when we say something and when you guys hear. So by the time you're, I see your question, he must, he might have already moved to another uh, topic, but don't worry. As soon as we find a little gap or I find a little gap, I'll ask that question. So keep it interact uh, interactive. Please ask questions. Uh, this is your chance to learn how to build this e-commerce uh, performance framework. So with that, I am going to uh, give the mic to Johnny and let him talk about you know, e-commerce performance framework. But before that, Johnny, why don't you tell us about you, your experience, and why should people be paying attention to what you're about to say today? Sure. Thanks very much, Chanel. Um, and hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, so, yeah, uh, my name's Johnny. Um, I'm, I'm currently the uh, e Experimentation and Performance Consulting Director of an agency called Journey Further, which on a wide level is a performance marketing agency. Um, and we're part agency, part consultancy. So we help uh, we help clients basically embed experimentation and conversion into their businesses, either through consulting or through uh, them outsourcing some of that stuff to us. Um, my background, I've been in, in conversion optimization since it was invented, really. Um, I first got into it around the time that Google first uh, produced the uh, website up optimizer tool um, and I've been running experiments ever since on lots of clients I've worked in agencies I've worked as a management consultant and client side uh, in particular I built a, a big in-house experimentation team in Sky in the UK um, and I've, I've helped the likes of Manchester United and Nike and people like that embed uh, digital analytics and experimentation in what they do and um, I produce a lot of content on LinkedIn so if you don't follow me for Feel free to connect to me or follow me um, and on Twitter as well. Thanks very much. And yeah, I am in the UK. I'm not in London. I'm in um, a place called Nairsborough, which is in the north of England, um, near a, a town called Harrogate. Um, and thanks very much, Anil, for having me on. Cool. You're welcome. So yeah, let's dive in and let's yeah. uh, look at what you have here. Right. And like I said, guys, please make sure to leave your comments here so that I can read any questions you have, you know. Feel free to jump in. 
thanks. And also, just uh, apologies in advance if I get invaded by my children. Um, it's kind of the witching hour here in the UK at the moment, so they, they might barge in. But uh, yeah. that's all right. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's used to that now. Anyway. My son sneaks in sometimes in the back yeah, yeah. here. You know, that's the joy of working from home, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They get to see what you're doing. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so I'm just going to go through what, what is an e-commerce performance framework. It's worth noting as well, like this, this, is a, this focuses on an example that relates to e-commerce. But this framework can be used for a, a variety of different um, business needs. For, uh, and really, it can be used for any sort of website or app or anything really or probably even wider um so then i'll look at like why you actually need one and then the, the brunt of it is like how to do it which is building building an example with a specific kind of fairly fictional example and then how do you actually put it to work so what is an e-commerce performance framework well this is something that i've actually been using for many years um for different types of clients and in all sorts of different aspects of work that I do. And ultimately, all it really is, is a framework that is designed to align the strategy of your business or your website or your project or product or whatever, the strategy for it, and particularly the, the profit strategy for it with how you measure how it's doing and how you uh, improve it, basically. And that's, it's fairly, uh, fairly simple in that respect. Um, so what it ultimately does is looks is looks to try and answer five key questions. How does uh, you know in this case e-commerce that we're talking about? How does e-commerce drive profit into the business? Um, how does it actually generate margin? Um, and that's not as straightforward as a lot of people think it is. And a lot of business have businesses quite surprisingly don't necessarily go through the process of articulating that very well in a way that can be communicated around the organisation. Two, what are the things that you can do? What are the levers that you can pull in order to actually increase that profitability? So once you realize how profitability work, what, what are the things that you can do to make it better? Um, how do you then translate those things that you can do into things that customers need to do? So how do you translate those into customer centric goals? And then getting into the more detailed side of it, what are the data and metrics that will tell you whether or not you are satisfying those customer centric goals? And what are the actions that you need to take in order to influence that customer behavior and to therefore increase profitability? So at the top is like understanding how profitability works and then really like how do you specifically drive the right customer behavior that, that makes that profitability happen? Cool. One um, question here from yeah. Sebastian. Will you share the presentation after the webinar? Sure. Uh, yeah, you'll have the presentation as Johnny confirmed, but you'll also have the replay of this session available as well. Cool. So why do you need one? Well, um, basically the ultimate reason behind it is to is to um, trickle down from uh, from the idea of a strategy into the things that you do, so that what you're doing is aligned to that profitability. And as you'll see as I go through it. That isn't necessarily that straightforward. Like, you know, you you um, can, you know, the profitability of your business can be quite specific. You have a specific strategy for thinking about profitability. You might, for example, want to drive margin by um, marking up a product in a high way. And therefore, you need to justify that by um, having a, a, a premium brand or something to do with customer service or whatever. So these specifics then need to really trickle down into everything you do. And if you get that wrong, um, you will run your business in a fairly generic way. You know, you'll set up a website and measure it according to generic KPIs and things like that, which are not speaking to that strategy. So that's really why it, why it, why it exists. And that will become more apparent as I go through it. So the, the first level is really what is that strategy? How do you articulate what your what your profitability strategy is and how you're going to make margin and how ultimately your business is going to be successful? Because obviously you know, success in a business is ultimately about profit or it should be. Um, and then once you understand that, how do you measure whether or not you are uh, delivering against that and how whether the business is, is running in a way that will drive that profitability? And then finally, how do you uh, identify the right actions and behaviours that can do that? So that's, that's what it's about. And it's about really a kind of a top-down um, view that starts with with the critical thinking about what you know why your business exists. So the five steps to actually doing it 
um, the approach really at a high level, um, and I, I alluded to this in what I went through before, is, you know, first of all, you look at your own business and internally, like, what do you want to achieve and how do you want to achieve um, profitability, which is almost a kind of a shareholder type view. And that doesn't mean you've got shareholders necessarily, but it's like, what are the, what are the interests of the people who own and run that business and, and what do they want to achieve out of it? And that's where that kind of profitability aspect comes in. But you can't really run a business um, with that direct profitability in mind. Like, you know, um, customers don't come to you to give you profit. They come to you to uh, achieve something or to get something for themselves. So you then flip it round into looking at a more customer centric view. What's the, what's the thing that you want customers to do that has a benefit to them, which ulti ultimately gives you profit in the way that you want it to. So that's the approach is looking at it from two different angles and ultimately ending up with the customer centric framework. So given that in mind, the first thing is to think about how does, how does e-commerce drive profit for you? And that's really an articulation of business strategy. Now, just, just to step away from this for a second and just tell a bit of a story. Um, a long time ago, a uh, very long time ago, actually, I was working for a digital agency and we had a client who um, sold CDs on the Internet. You know, this is how old it was. Um, and, you know, they they just, you know, ha had a website where you go and buy CDs, actually DVDs and things like that as well. Um, and we started working with them in, in terms of uh, redesigning some of their website and doing some optimization and stuff like that. And my first question in one of the discovery meetings was how, how does the website make money? Like why, why does the website exist for you? Mm -hmm. And, um, and they, the, the CEO, it was a relatively small business, so, you know, it grew a bit after that, but the CEO almost kind of laughed and he said, well, we sell CDs. Um, and I said, right. Yeah. But, but, you know, what's your strategy? Like, how does it make profit? Like, you know, are you trying to undercut other websites that make CDs and therefore you're, you know, you're going after a value-based play? Are you trying to generate loyalty? So, you know, you're um, selling cheap CDs as a loss leader and then using relationship marketing in order to um, try and, you know, uh, develop longevity from those customers and not have to spend money on acquisition like what's the strategy and he kind of looked at me quite blankly and and realized that you know they hadn't really properly thought about that um as they'd set up the business and and you know it is quite common to find that that either people you know in less 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 common is people haven't really thought about it but more common is they haven't articulated it in a way that can be communicated to the other people that work in the business and the other people that are on the bottom line so you know what you're ultimately trying to do is is articulate that that ultimate business strategy in a way that can trickle down into the different parts of the business and on the left left here there's a few examples of what that might look like so the one that i already mentioned is like you know maybe maybe you're selling at a, a high rate you're, you're selling at a high price and marking up products at a high price um, and that's where your margin comes from but you need to justify that that high price through maybe customer service or something like that now, if that's the case, then when you get down to actually operationally running the business, you know, so you take something like the website, then, um, you know, the, the communications objective of the website has to really focus on the service that you're going to get afterwards. It would be a mistake to just have a fairly generic website that's selling product and is not explaining the service that you're getting. So that becomes a very core uh, communications objective of the website. And, uh, you know, another one, uh, so, you know, your margin might come from your supply chain. Um, so uh, relying on, um, you know, efficiencies in the supply chain that other competitors don't have. You've cut out a middleman or something like that. And that's what gives you competitive differentiation. So in that case, um, what are the things that need to happen operationally for that to happen? I'm not going to go through all of these, but you get the point. You know, you, you're trying to kind of trickle down to doing the right things in the right areas that ladder back up to that and it, it kind of seems obvious but as i said like very rarely do you come across people who are doing this really well because um you know it might be understood at a senior level but then the person running paid search or the person like running optimization for the website do they understand that are they working to the same stuff are they all on the same page very often not mm-hmm 
So, um, so the first thing is like, what are the levers that you can pull in order to drive that profit strategy? And this is really where you get down to kind of articulating the profit strategy. And um, the rest of this presentation is building up an example of this framework using this uh, semi-fictitious example of a particular company. So before I go through that, I'll just introduce this company to you and what their strategy is. Um, so this is a manufacturer of kitchen utensils and appliances, and typically they have they have distributed and sold those products only through third party retailers, either physical retailers or, or online marketplaces and, you know, Amazon, as you can imagine. Um, but over time, they've developed a very strong brand recognition and people start to really love those products and become aware of the brand. And so they decided to launch their own website to sell direct to consumer um, and did that. And then as a result, they, they realized that um, that the direct sell through their own website has an enormous benefit to them because overall it is a much lower cost per acquisition and it is a more profitable way to sell than wholesaling or you know through or commission based models through other people and stuff like that so basically you know they 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 want to build on their brand um, equity that's happened and and generate more direct sell which creates margin because they're not basically paying fees to other people or you know discounting for wholesale and all that kind of stuff so mm -hmm. and so really the strategy is to leverage the brand elevate the dtc offering and win over third party retail so bear that in mind because that that's going to flow through the rest of that and it's very important that they're that they're trying to kind of elevate their own brand over their their uh, uh, heartland at the moment which is really third party retail so this is really the kind of first part of the framework which looks very much internally at profit and you know profit is a product of uh, revenue and cost obviously and revenue comes broadly from acquisition uh, value and retention and when you want to reduce costs typically that can happen through the cost of selling i marketing and things like that or operational cost and so um, i won't go through all of this in a lot of detail but this is really you know looking at what are the specific things that can be done to achieve that profit strategy and for example in the acquisition space um you know, they've already got a very strong brand um, and uh, in order to sort of start to deliver that direct to consumer benefit, they can start to amplify that through PR and stuff like that. But the, but the more important part there is that what they're specifically trying to do is outrank and outbid third party retailers in search. So, you know, you, you know this product, you want the uh, garlic crusher or whatever, and you go and search for it on Google and historically you're going to see Amazon... Um, various other retailers um, and so what they need to do in order to deliver against this strategy of theirs is to outrank that either mm -hmm. organically or from a paid search point of view and um, similarly um, customer value really is about uh, upsell so um, you know a big part of that strategy ultimately comes from the fact that once somebody's bought something from you once then if you can get them to come back then again, you don't need to rely on third-party retailers, and if you generate that relationship, then you're, uh, you know, you're generating effectively a kind of owned media platform and all this sort of stuff. So, upselling of upselling of products on the website is very key, which would never really happen in a third-party retailer because you're just going to buy one thing, but they then have the ability to then sort of upsell you and cross-sell you to all that sort of stuff. So, you know, a few other little things here in um, uh, the sort of marketing. Um, you know, just the, the fact that you've got no third party reseller wholesale commissions and stuff like that is, is really the way that margin is going to happen. Um, and operationally, um, you know, the, uh, the product efficacy. So if you can prove that the product really works, then, um, you know, through communications and through uh, helping people understand how to use it, then that increases word of mouth. So these are really just levers that you can pull uh, and an articulation of how that that profit strategy works. But very importantly then, how do you translate that into customer-centric specific goals? And this starts to build um, a framework that will seem a little bit more familiar to most people because it's kind of like a funnel. Mm -hmm. But here, 
you know, you've, you, and this can be bespoke, it'd be very different for different clients, but the top line will, will be fairly uh, familiar. You know, you're trying to attract people, you're trying to connect with them and actually get them to come to your platform, give them product information, convert them, um, deliver that product in a nice way, and then perhaps, perhaps nurture them to do something else. But here's the really important point, because um, what do you need to do in each of those buckets that relates to that profit strategy that you've just um, you've just identified? So attracting customers um, is not just generically, you know, how do we drive traffic to the website? How do we do some advertising? Because what we're saying here is the customer has to know and desire the product and specifically want to purchase it direct because they understand the benefit. So, you know, the, the mistake there where you start to go wrong would be to go, you know, we just need to raise awareness. So let's raise awareness of our product through advertising. Now you can do that, but you're, you're going to be raising awareness of the product and then driving people into the third party retailers. And that is not your strategy. Your strategy is to communicate and get people to understand that they can buy from you directly. Similarly, um, when somebody lands on the website, if you, you know, connect is really about getting them to land on the website and the initial landing experience and communications. Now that really importantly there, you have to communicate the benefit of buying over third party purchase. So, you know, if I if I've if I've put in a product into Google and there are various retailers selling it and I click on your website, um, I've, I don't really recognize the website, it's the brand, but I think, well, uh, I, I usually buy everything from Amazon and it's probably cheaper and quicker to get it delivered. So I'll just get it from Amazon then you really need to communicate and you need to make a communications objective out of every landing touch point about why somebody should buy from you directly. Um, so these things here are really just sort of, you know, it's the critical bit of thinking that's saying, what do we need to always remember in each of these different pillars um, that will deliver against that profit, profit strategy? Um, just just running through them a, a bit more briefly for the rest of them, like, you know, to inform people, yeah, they need they need the information about the product in order to be able to purchase it. But as we saw before, a big part of the strategy ends up being how do we cross sell them other products at the same time? How do we start to add value uh, and, and generate um, further revenue by, by adding stuff on? So making sure that people are aware of the range of products and cross sell becomes a whole strategy about how the website works. Um, converting is obviously, uh, um, you know, a, a fairly mechanical part of the process. But again, I am compelled in the per process to purchase add-ons. So, you know, that has to be a fundamental part of how the, how the checkout funnel works. Um, actually receiving the goods, so fulfillment, um, is one of the things that will differentiate you against uh, third parties so that has to be better you have to you have to think about how that delivery is going to be better because that's really one of the solid things that differentiates you unless you're going to undercut which most people won't do to wholesalers um, and and nurture you know really is very much about like the relationship marketing aspect of it um, uh, so, so I, I have a question here yeah I, you were talking about the benefits why should somebody should buy from your site compared to a third party retailer. It's the product that you're selling there as well, right? The benefit that you are highlighting is you build that relationship with your customer here. That's the benefit to the organization. But how do you say, do you have any examples of how like uh, companies can differentiate because it's the same price it's selling there versus here? Some of the things that you have helped clients or your clients have done like examples? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's there's various different ways. I mean, uh, the uh, price is an obvious one um, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit sensitive, like, you know, so um, so a lot of a lot of companies in this kind of situation won't want to undercut um, what they're you know, what they're selling to third parties because it's, you know, it's, it doesn't do the relationship with the wholesaler and the third party is much good. Um, but However, you can um, discount if you, you know, more sensitively, if you say create some kind of loyalty program. So, mm -hmm. you know, like the price of the product on your website is the exact same that it's going to be on other retail prices. But 
there's nothing really to stop you and that would damage that third party relationship if you say you know sign up to our this program and you get 10 percent off your first order or something like that um so that that i've seen that be successful across a variety of things and a common place you'll see that is in the hotel industry um mm-hmm. yes it's yeah. a different market to this but um you know in, in the hotel industry you can buy um, rooms from Booking.com and Expedia and everywhere else like that. And actually, um, OTAs like that have agreements with hotels that they will not sell at a different price. But that it is possible to do that if you're selling at a lower price as part of a, a loyalty program or relationship. Okay. Yeah, so, I, actually, to that point, you, you uh, I reminded me of something. So I booked a hotel... Uh, through Booking.com because it was a bit cheaper for me to get from Booking.com because Booking.com had some incentive for me. Yeah. And then when I went to the hotel and it was uh, Hyatt and I looked at the price there and I figured it's actually I can work with them to get a lower price and I, which I did. And yeah. it, because I was I'm a loyal member and they were able to give me a better price and even a free night in there, which was actually a better deal than what I was getting from booking.com. So I think that's great where if it was it's they articulate the benefits of like loyalty program. Hey, if you work, uh, if you book directly with us, you could potentially get a lot more benefits. Yeah. So there were other benefits as well. The, and, another another thing, like, you know, a completely separate thing would be. Um, you know, just a, a brand thing, you know, like you, you can, um, if you, if you can sort of welcome people into your brand and, and get people engaged with the brand in a really engaging way, then a lot of the time that will, that will just feel a lot better than, than buying something from a third party retailer. You know, if you, if you really love a product, um, then, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a logical thing that people want to engage with that particular brand and think, you know, they might, they might sort of get interest in communications from them. They might start to get discounts from them in the future. Whereas buying a product from that brand from a big retailer like Amazon or anywhere else is a fairly impersonal experience. So, um, yeah. I mean, th- this doesn't, this framework doesn't necessarily, um, you know, isn't, isn't really trying to dictate how that stuff works. Correct. Yeah. It's just, it's just highlighting what needs to happen. Like, you know, what so, needs- um, you know, and if, and again, like, you know, if, if you ha- if you didn't go through this process, then, um, ultimately what might happen, so, like, you know, say you just, you know, this is a new business, you set up a website, you hire a brand person and you hire a, um, paid search person and stuff like that and they just sort of set off and run then those those people are going to run with fairly generic ideas of how this stuff works mm-hmm. and um you know they would they would naturally be trying to sell product but what gets what's forgotten in that is that the whole point is to try and um is to try and elevate the brand over and above third party retailers. And that yep. that's not something that you necessarily see in the normal data from a website and things like that. So this is all about really kind of just constantly remembering what it is you're trying to do and do and trickling this stuff down to the people who are going to work on it. Yep. So cool. um so the next thing is like what what how do you measure um whether or not these things are working? Um, and in this example, um, you know, just kind of put in some metrics here. Now, b- just before I go through these, I think there's a really, really important point here, which is um, what a lot of people do is to start with the data and what they can measure. And th- I've seen that so many times have a really, really detrimental impact on how businesses are run. Uh, I did a consulting project recently with a very big company who had really done that. And um, what happens is you're, you're, you're just kind of measuring what you happen to have as a piece of data. Um, and then basically kind of uh, that ends up dictating what you do in the strategy you know that famous adage what gets measured gets done um, and it's really the wrong way to do it because you 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 really need to top down think how do we measure this strategy rather than um let's create a strategy out of what we can measure Maybe. so yeah. you know to, you, you need to go through these things and think with without worrying about whether or not there's data available at least temporarily how do you measure these things? So, um, you know, that first part, I know and desire the product and specifically wish to purchase it direct because I understand the benefit. 
Well, with, within that, there is, um, you know, product awareness and belief. People need to be aware of the product, which is a fairly, you know, is a fairly kind of generic thing. But second, um, the brand benefit, the brand benefit awareness of purchasing direct. So that's a very specific thing. You want people at a brand level to understand why they should buy direct and, um, you know, how do you measure that? Don't know yet. You know, you, it would end up being a brand study. Um, but if you don't identify these things conceptually first and then go and figure out how to measure them, you will create big gaps in what you're doing and not and not be able to drive what it is that you're doing. And then the third part is, re is really interesting. So share of share of SERP versus third party retail. Now, again, if you if you think about if you if you just get a PPC manager or a PPC agency or something like that and go up, you know, off you go do our PPC, then they're almost definitely going to start working to something like ROAS or, you know, another sort of fairly generic way of measuring paid search activity. And that would have completely negated your profit strategy because, um, you know, yes, you could, you could bring in traffic to the website and convert it and, and have a really good return on ad spend in PPC. But if you're not specifically thinking about whether that is achieving the job of bringing in traffic over and above the third party retail, then you have missed the point of your strategy. So you don't want to measure it like that. You want to measure um, the share of the search results page and the ranking against it. So, I, you know, you want to know for a, for a term and for aggregated terms, how are you ranking for those terms versus those third party retailers? Mm -hmm. And your, you know, you might decide that your return on ad spend can be, um, not as attractive as it should be because you want to achieve that. So again, you know, really important that you you think about these things from the point of view of the strategy, and then go and figure out how to measure them. Yeah, um, that's that. Yeah, I just want to interject here, but yeah. continue. Or uh, yes, yeah, what I what I was going to say is this is a very very critical point that I keep highlighting. I mean, I've been teaching analytics for quite some time, like 16 plus years. One of the things I always teach is don't look at what tools can do for you right now, what tools can measure and what, what you measure. A new breed of analysts are basically all about hacking and saying you can measure scroll depth, you can measure this and you can measure that. And I'm like, what's the point? It First, you need to define your strategy. What are you trying to achieve? What is the objective? Then come to what do we need to measure and figure out the tools that'll allow you to do it. Just don't go start implementing everything. Yeah, so yeah, very, very very, uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's so many times you kind of start working with businesses and and they've got a dashboard that's like the volume of traffic and time on site and things like that. And you're like, what? What does that tell you? That you know, it's, yeah, it, it, you know, it's telling you some numbers, but it's not telling you anything about what it is that you're trying to achieve. It's not, it's not answering your business questions. Business question. Yeah. The, the top line here are your specific business questions that you're trying to answer. And these are just a set of metrics, but your analysis should completely flow from that as well. You know, if you can, if you can find a way to measure the share of SERP versus third party retail, then by default, you're going to end up with the data that tells you what to do about it as well. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and then, you know, this like in the second column there, You've got uh, what, you know, again, I've just made up completely conceptually is direct benefit viewability. So if you take the idea that, you know, a really core communications objective of the landing experiences of the website, be they landing pages or the homepage or whatever, is to communicate um, why you should buy direct, then you could, uh, you can quite imagine fairly easily creating a metric which says, to what extent have people who land on the website been exposed to that direct benefit? Um, and, you know, that, that could just be a case of have they landed on pages where it says it, or you could actually, you know, say, have they scrolled down far enough to see it or whatever. But, um, you know, that's almost like an ad viewability thing on a publishing website. But, you know, you, have to, you, you would optimize then, that then by going, well, where's the significant landing places that people are coming in where they're not seeing it? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and how do we how do we add it there? <clears throat> so these these metrics are all things that you know are number one going to tell you as you trend them over time 
whether or not you're actually able to move these things. But they also the basis of the analysis that then tells you what to optimize. And, uh, and that's really the third part of it, which is what are the specific actions that you can take to, to ultimately drive that I, profit? Before you go there, I have a yeah. comment from Michael Huntington. He's, yes, this is us. I don't have more details from him. Michael, if you can put some more details, but I think you were referring to like, we're measuring everything, right? Uh, without the strategy, is that what you're saying? Or just clarify that. Cool. Yeah, we can go. I'll read Michael's comment when it comes. Yeah. So there's, this is where it kind of all ultimately arrives at is, is what do you do about it? Because um, obviously, um, you know, data and measurement is kind of irrelevant unless you do something off the back of it, unless you take action off the back of it. So that's that's where it ultimately arrives at, which is this third line here, which is is, is what do you optimize? Um, and, and this is really just about kind of, in a way, bucketing out the things that you're going to optimize. Um, but then, you know, a, a, a level of detail that's not provided here, you have to think, how do you optimize those things? And those have to ladder back up to the top. So, um, you know, if you take that first column there, brand communications, um, well, if you hadn't been through this process and you just hire a brand agency or whatever, they're going to kind of understand that, you know, you're, they're going to understand that, you know, people like your products because of whatever. This is this is your brand. This is why people love you. This is your tone of voice, and create advertising about that. But that would that would forget the point that you are also really trying to communicate the direct benefit and to create this direct relationship that that um, circumnavigates third parties, and that has to be a really core part of the brand. Um, paid media again, like you know, you're you're not just as I was saying, you're not optimizing for return on ad spend. You're optimizing for the ability for paid media to circumnavigate those third parties, and then you know things like the value proposition. Uh, you know, you're you, often you like if you take if we go into the realms of sort of experimentation, A/B testing, and more traditional conversion optimization, mm -hmm. you're going to optimize a value proposition for conversion. So let's say you've got landing pages that say, um, you know, this is the this is why you should um, buy this product or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and you will play around with that copy to try and increase conversion. But um, again, thinking about this, this strategy, the value proposition has to encourage you to come back and buy direct. Um, and you cannot see in any data whether or not people are leaving to buy from a third party. So you almost have an objective in and of itself to simply communicate that direct benefit. And you might measure it by, you know, you might be able to measure it by returning visits or something like that. But um, again, when you kind of design that out, you're not simply just driving everything towards this generic idea of conversion. You're, you're optimizing certain things for your strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've got the question yet? Yeah. No, so Michael's comment. Right. Uh, there's no question, but yes. Okay. He's just saying, yes, exactly. Data first, not strategy first. So that's what they're doing. So, you know, yeah. time to re redo stuff, right? So think about strategy and, you know, it's critical. You, you mentioned this. I mean, this is one example I keep bringing. For a long, long time, Amazon wasn't profitable, right? And their whole strategy was also to push third party products on their site. You know, but you can buy this from this and it's cheaper here. The whole point was because their strategy was to drive more third party vendors on their platform, not sell their products, which is most of the e-commerce companies start with. So once you start to think about strategy, then you're, how will you measure it and all the stuff like what you put on your landing pages, what your value prop and all the call to actions, everything aligns with that strategy. So it's yeah. critical to have that strategy first and it can change, right? So it's about your goals, objectives, everything changes. You know, what it was last year might not be the same thing that you're driving today. So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Look, a, a good example of how it can go wrong at like quite a big scale really is. Um, so I did a consulting project a while ago for a, a very big company who um, have a, a big sort of loyalty program. So they're mm -hmm. a, a subscription business and then have a, a, a fairly unrelated loyalty program that, you know, helps um, keep people on this subscription. And um, 
And so they, they run this loyalty program, which provides offers and stuff like that, like, you know, lots of companies do. And um, really, when you absolutely think about it, the point of it is to keep is to retain people on their wider subscription. So, um, you know, it, the only way that's going to work is if they think that I'm getting something that is so valuable that mm-hmm. I'm not going to bother switching to another supplier. Um, yep. it's, it's so good that it's going to keep me here. Um, but they, they'd gone through exactly that process of starting out with the data and what was easy to measure. And what they could measure was how many people were on this program, had literally accepted the program, how many people um, had accepted an offer. And, um, and that was more or less it. So that, that was most of their metrics were about the adoption of the program and whether or not you'd whether accepted an offer. <clears throat> and when I looked at it, I just said, well, I could, I could download your app and be on your loyalty program and um, get a load of offers from you. But I could still think that that's not really that different from anywhere I can get anywhere else. And that would not keep me with you as a customer on your main subscription thing. And um, so really like it's, it, it, they were all completely focused on getting people onto the loyalty program and, and having all these offers. But when you really step back and think about it, it's like, it's only going to work if those offers are amazing, if they're like really, really valuable. Yeah. And so, you know, you've, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're focusing on, on just the volume of getting people onto it and not what it makes them think and not whether it makes them loyal to you because giving somebody a, you know, a discount off a cup of coffee is, um, you know, not that beneficial. It's like, you know, I can get that anyway. You can, you can just open up a ton of like offer apps and get a cup of coffee free or whatever, or half price or whatever. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it, it, you, you just see how it kind of really focuses people in the wrong area when they've not really gone down that, that strategic thinking point. Yeah. Um, so just a few of the quick examples here, like, uh, you know, we said already that, um, that upselling is really key in this strategy. So, um, we, you know, uh, when you have an optimization program, rather than just focusing on conversion, you have a specific objective to uh, increase average order value by upselling it mm-hmm. at, the, at, at both the uh, product point and the checkout point. And that becomes a, a particular part of that optimization program. Um, you know, navigation and uh, information architecture is really key because you're, you need people to understand that there are other products. If somebody just comes into the, if somebody searched for a garlic crusher or whatever, and they come into the site um, to buy that, uh, you know, successfully not having bought it from Amazon or wherever, then um, you need them to be able to explore the rest of your product range because that's the whole point, right? You need them to understand that they can buy a load of other products and what the other things are that you sell, which they may not have been aware of. So again, the, you know, the, the actual way that you execute these things and the way you test things, it, it forms a particular way, which you wouldn't necessarily think about if you were just thinking more generically. Um, so that's kind of a, that's kind of the framework. That is it. I mean, it's, it, it's a, it's a high level thing. And I'll just in a minute, talk about how you kind of operationalize it. But um mm-hmm. Anil, I don't know if you've got any other questions or if there's any other Yeah, questions. I'm just looking. Hey, guys, any questions here? I'm just going to comment on something. Uh, the whole thing that you have talked about, you know, initially I was talking about how do you not, not or how do you drive people to buy from your platform versus third-party platform and then measuring, uh, you know, what is your strategy there, right? And then how do you measure it? So one of the things that we do actually, and the price point, we were talking about the price point. So one of the things we do is, so on Optizent Academy, we have tons of digital analytics, conversion optimization, et cetera, digital marketing courses. You can buy those courses for a lower price, maybe many third-party platforms, just individual courses. But when we sell, actually, it, it's much more expensive to buy on our platform. So our strategy is kind of flipped there. And the whole point is because the value is much more here. There you're buying a course here, you're buying the whole experience and the support you get. So 
that's the value it's when people ask me like why can i why can't i buy there cheaper i'm sure you can go buy it cheaper there oh i hit my mic here you can buy it cheaper there but you're not going to get the support that you need to be successful in it's self serve right versus here you get the full support in the team and everything so those are the some of the differentiators and the way we measure some some of those things is again the retention that we're doing because our strategies and how much engagement we are getting now how do we measure those things are not very clear and like you know any tool you can look at and say you know I, i'm going to look at google analytics there is much more than just looking at google analytics numbers so you have to look at other tools i yeah. saw your tweet yesterday or this morning maybe uh, or not tweet on linkedin where you yeah. mentioned the digital analytics versus uh, you know you can't measure everything within a tool like google analytics right yeah that's it yeah and that, yeah. well i mean that's the point about that is like um you, you i think you know like really uh google analytics sort of lulls people into a false sense of having exactly. analytics yeah um, when actually an real analytics the proper definition of the word is a much deeper thing that is really starts with things like this, you know, so that really, really it's answering proper business questions. Um, and, um, and, and that is a, a, a very sort of skilled thing really that, um, but, you know, literally because Google analytics has the word analytics in it, a lot of people think that they therefore have analytics. <laughs> they can put everything there and just measure all those things. And then, yeah, it's like, we, you know, we've got <laughs> analytics because we've got Google analytics. No, you haven't because, because that is a very particular skill set and a very particular way of thinking. To, to yeah, I mean, if, if I look at your optimizer, you know, leading indicators right there, like what are we doing here? How many of those can actually be measured by a tool like Adobe Analytics or Google Analytics? Or, yeah, right? and I think the, the, the wider point is that, um, you know, even an, an imperfect way of measuring something that is properly aligned to your business question and is and is giving you something helpful is far better than a really perfect way of measuring something yeah. you know if you have to if you have to make some assumptions and make some guesses and cobble something together and you know it's not really perfect if it is driving you in the right direction and it's and it's creating the right action then that's way better than having like an insanely perfect metric that's super accurate and all that kind of stuff. Because ultimately yeah. that's what it's supposed that, you know, measurement and, and, and data and analysis is supposed to, it's supposed to drive you in, in, you know, it's supposed to create action. And if it's creating the wrong action, then, you know, what's the point? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, this is critical. You spend, you have to spend a lot of time thinking through these things before you even start to put your, data collection in place. Think through it, like, uh, w are we measuring the right stuff? Is the whole organization on board? Like you were talking about, you know, here's a PPC manager or PPC analyst doing something, a big, great search guy. And here is a CEO who's thinking about this thing, the overall organization strategy. It takes a lot of time to get, make sure people understand what the overall objective is. What are we trying to achieve here? and then align everybody and make sure the right measures are in place. This takes months sometimes to actually come up with the right measures. So it's yeah. not like something you can just do tomorrow. Hey, we yeah. had a and meeting and let's put it together and here's my metric. Yeah. And like I said, like quite early on in the presentation, um, you know, there are, there are businesses who just haven't been through the process of thinking about this, but more often than not, um, you know, the person who runs the business, knows exactly what their profit strategy is um they just ne haven't necessarily articulated it in a way that can be communicated mm -hmm. into the right areas of business in the right way uh, or it's or it's something that is just looked at, at like quite a senior level um and it's not properly trickled down into different parts of the business so you know you've got to think like how does that profit strategy translate into who into what the person who is responsible for returns is doing you know like what how are they measuring what they're doing and how does that ladder up to the overall strategy um you know otherwise you you're just gonna um get somebody 
you know, trying to deliver some like, you know, things as efficiently as possible. Whereas maybe that's not the strategy. Maybe, you know, in this case, um, you know, you might want re returns to just be a way better customer experience than any mm -hmm. other retailer. And so actually, um, you know, you should be pumping quite a bit of, uh, of, of cash into it and, and, and almost sort of, recognizing that it's a bit of a loss center because, but that's fine because it's, you know, it's delivering against the rest of the business strategy. Um, now, if that's not communicated really well and that's not set up really well by whoever is managing that, then how would they know to do that? You know, so, um, and, you know, in a way, in a way, these things feel obvious, but like when you actually go and work with companies, they, they haven't necessarily done it. Like, you know, it's not that often that, that people are really aligned like that. Um, so the, uh, the next part really is like to, is to, is what you do. And like, I'm, I'm not going into the detail of this, but that is quite a high level framework and, and what you do sort of really is a bit of a process where you, you know, you've conceptually identified how you're going to measure things and that, and it absolutely should be conceptual. You shouldn't worry about whether or not the data exists to mm -hmm. do that at the point that you come up with those concepts. And then the net, the first step is to go and find out how you really are going to measure them. And, you know, you might, you might sort of adapt what they are slightly and, um, you know, and, and change what they are slightly, but you should stay true to the thing that you're measuring and find the best possible way to measure those things, however imperfect it might be. Um, and then, and then two, you need to uh, create some kind of goals for them. Um, and that might be a case of just fairly arbitrarily saying like, you know, where we should, we, you know, we, we should be able to achieve more in this, but also there's an opportunity there to, um, strategically prioritize which of those areas. So say if you end up with like five KPIs that, that speak to the different, um, different customer objectives that you're trying to achieve, um, then, you know, you might know based on your strategy that the fulfillment part is really the most important like getting that right is what's going to deliver this or or in, you know in this in this example you might say that actually it's about acquisition and it's about bringing people in um and and winning over the third party retailers in search so from a from a goal point of view your strategy should uh should um, create prioritization in those metrics in terms of what you want to where, where you want to focus on trying to improve and then you can do more sort of normal stuff like you know you you've, you can create a, a a metrics dashboard and monitor against goals and things like that. The difference is is that's going to be really super meaningful. Now you know that 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 dashboard is going to be incredibly meaningful and will and you know will speak volumes to what the business is trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and you know it, it's time and time again you see just as I said you see a dashboard and you think this is this is some numbers like what does it actually say like what's it actually doing and and that and this whole process is how you end up with a dashboard that doesn't do that um and then and then really you're going into the sort of like nitty-gritty of um how do you how do you drive insight analysis and research that says what do you do about those metrics so you know you you're the the metrics are levers you're trying to pull so then what's the more granular data under that that will tell you what to do about it um you then would basically uh uh start to understand what you need from a technology point of view in order to start to understand that stuff better and to optimize it better um and then you can think about the process so um and that really is um you know, these become sort of, you know, in a big business, you've then, you've, you've really got areas of the business. You might even structure the business according to the framework. Um, but outside of that, you know, you've, you've got like, so this person is responsible for that metric and for, under, and for analyzing that metric and moving the needle on that. And this person is responsible for that. And that's really how you end up with the start of a, a, a continuous improvement program, an optimization program, and ultimately that kind of ends up with an in a, what I would call an innovation ecosystem. What I mean by that is a topic for a completely different um, presentation, but ultimately 
that's what we call a it's like a, a sort of operating system and process for how you basically go from this high level framework down to what people are actually doing and how that's coordinated and how that is um, managed and um, and, uh, and and you know can be monitored across the board and, and, and scaled so yeah that's you know there's not much information there about what you do next the point of this presentation was was to show the framework mm -hmm. um, but just to round out the presentation and then I'm sure we can discuss further but uh, just very quickly, I am incredibly open always to speaking to anybody. Um, and so if anybody that's watching wants to just chat a bit more, um, uh, uh, you know, personally about their own specific challenges and things like that, I'm always more than happy to have a quick chat with people. Um, so let me just flick back to the framework. And I guess um, if there's any other questions that have come in or um, yeah. any of the discussion points. Cool. This was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Always, you know, every time I hear your mess, see your messages I hear, it's like there's something new to learn. So it's great. And this framework is great. Right. Any, any questions you guys have, please type those questions. And I will get this uh, slide deck from Johnny and e uh, send an email. So if yeah. you have, uh, have aren't registered at Optizent Academy, for this session, I'll drop a link in the comment. You can register there so that you get an email. Obviously, you'll get some other marketing email from me. Uh, but, okay, no question so far. I'll give uh, a few seconds here. And um, that link that you have, if you can drop that link, or I'll copy that link and also put in the comment so that people can book time with you for 30 minutes. Yes, yeah. great. Cool. Michael wrote something and took it back. So, all right, guys, I have a question, Michael. Sure, go ahead. Do you not find with the imperfect data point? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question. I, if say you are trying to push through changes, all right, maybe you're still typing. I'll let you type the whole question. So all I see here is, do you not find with the imperfect data point if say you are trying to push through changes. So are you saying you're trying to make changes, but you don't have all the data points and can you still do it? Okay, what? got it, okay. So- one up, one up. Oh, go on. And a mistake or error is found in the metrics you are using that it makes the rest of your points difficult to sell. So maybe it seems like you have some data issues I, I think I, I, yeah. I, yeah, I kind of I imagine because the you know the a lot of the time the objection you get is that imperfect data um, creates distrust in what you're doing because it mm -hmm. you know because it's not it's not perfect. Yeah, um, you know that is true, and you don't obviously want rubbish data. Um, the point is not just to kind of have any old crap data. Um, it's that you've got to kind of think about what it is that you're trying to measure so you know the 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 wrong way to do it is to go well we've got this question on this survey over here that tells us this so we'll use that as a kpi because kind of kind of relates to the website versus you go through this process and you would go we fundamentally need a new survey that asks the right question mm -hmm. um you know something like that so you know you're or you're you're not you know just identifying rubbish data um you know you, you you're just going through the process of thinking what is it that we really need and that might not be data that you have it might be data that you have to go and get but i think you know as well really like data and measurement and stuff like that is ultimately about storytelling and if you're not telling this story about strategy um then 
you know, that's that I think that is worse than being distrusted for sort of slightly imperfect data. So that example that I talked about um, with the company with the loyalty program, um, the reason that they got me involved was was exactly that reason. So um, the 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 board of the company um, were just not really buying that this loyalty program was worth all the money that it was that it was costing. Um, and that was because nobody could articulate through metrics what it was actually delivering. You know, all they could say is, well, like, you know, X percent of our customers are on the program. But nobody could say that that was having an impact on retention or mm -hmm. loyal or, or, you know, or, or on churn um, because there was no way to do that through the metrics and no framework like this. So, we, you know, regardless of the measurement that ever came out of the back of it, just by having the framework, you're able to say, look, we totally understand the what profit is about, what it's trying to deliver. And all of this is focused on getting everybody to do what is needed in order to deliver against that profit strategy. And that creates so much more confidence if you're talking to senior people about what it is that you're doing, then, you know, um, then having problems with like, well, what is that really that data? Um, I mean, you know, yeah, you don't want inaccurate data and rubbish data that in the, you never want that. But it, when I say imperfect data, I mean, it might not be the best possible thing you could measure. It might just, you know, but it's still, it's still, you know, something that you can measure that speaks to what it is you're trying to do. Cool. Any other questions? All right, guys, if you do have any questions, uh, you can leave them as comments and I will make sure Johnny answers those questions. So I'll reach out to him and let him know. If you haven't yet registered, uh, maybe, all right, Michael just has a comment. Thank you, that's great. Uh, the webinar has been excellent, so great. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So yeah, if you guys are not registered, you can go to academy.optizen.com and I'll drop a link here if you came directly to the YouTube. Uh, make sure to register so I can get an email and I'll send a link to this presentation as well as that replay. And you, there you'll have a link uh, to his calendar where you can book some time with him. So thank you very much. Shani, this was great. Yeah, thank and you very it's much. It's wonderful to have you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, I'm gonna end the stream at this point. Talk to you later, bye. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah.